billion Latham Access Road commissioned. Government to intervene will not allow Republic Bank to disrupt lives. And Public Telecommunications Minister hosts its third hackathon. Stay with us for the next half an hour as we take you through major stories covered from November 23 to 29. We begin with some major news. The Barak Retreat Corridor, which is the main access road into the Upper Takatu Upper Essequibo region, has been commissioned. Shaquille Bourne was in the region last weekend and filed that story. Latham, it is finally here. After the investment of $473 million, the dual carriageway barrack retreat corridor has been completed. During the commissioning ceremony here in the township, Prime Minister the Honorable Moses Nagamutu said that this project has become a reality due to the government's dedication. It takes vision, it takes plan, and we can use Latham as an example of where we have this vision. President David Granger is the man with the plan. The first thing he did was to transform this village into a town. And once you have become a capital, let them have become a capital of Rupanoni, then it requires certain status. It has to have certain facilities. And part of those facilities would be new roads. According to Minister of Indigenous Peoples Affairs, the Honorable Sidney Alicock, this road will be an economic driver for the township. This road was not built for party members or for a special set of people. It is being built for each and every Guyanese because that is what the coalition believes in. It was Minister of Natural Resources, the Honorable Raphael Trotman, who used this moment to capitalize on other successful projects in the region. Today you have a road, you have a radio station, and you have a two roundabouts. Give yourselves a roundabout one. The Minister of Public Infrastructure, the Honorable David Patterson, under whose leadership this project has become a reality, announced other plans for the region. This road is a part of an overall development program for Letem. The AP and UAFC government sees Letem as our mecca in the south. This is, ladies and gentlemen, only the very first piece of this problem. Going on, internal roads, when I say internal roads, the remainder of the roads will continue in 2020 and beyond. I will now hand you over to Isaiah Braffitt, who spoke with some residents within the region. A big relief is what residents of Blitham are calling the newly paved roads in the town, that is, moving from potholes to smoother and dust-free travel. We have better access, I could say, because I remember when you had to like go home, you had to go through, like, you know, the road wasn't really good, you had to ride to take your time. You know you had to look out because it was quite dangerous. But now, as you can see, the road is, I mean, it's way better than before, and it, it makes things much easier. No, well, of course, the road is better now than before. And from a person that got a vehicle, you know, the road before, every minute they got running, they workshop and them kind of things. So it's very good now that the road is paved, and it would be better we see more road being paved. Reporting from the township of Letham, I am Isaiah Braffitt with videographer Leon Leung for InfoHub. The government will not allow Republic Bank to disrupt the lives of thousands of Guyanese. This and more on this week's post-cabinet roundup with Paul McAdam. Cabinet met on November 19 and 26. Director General of the Ministry of the Presidency, Joseph Harmon, noted Cabinet's concern at the recent spate of road deaths, which numbered 106 as of November 26. Not only the numbers, but the quality of the persons. The young people 
who are dying, some of them in the prime of their youth. Some of these are well-qualified people who are now basically poised to take the benefit of what is going to happen to Guyana in terms of its development. And for the lives to be snuffed out in that way, it's really a painful thing. So as a government, we, we share that pain. And um, we will do whatever is necessary to ensure that our roads are safe. Cabinet was also briefed on the suspension of the IDB-funded Sheriff Street Road Expansion Project, remedial actions being taken, and the successful two-day Region 9 ministerial outreach. The latter saw the commissioning of the Bark Retreat four-lane road, wells, and substantial donations being made to various Indigenous communities. Cabinet thanked the ministers for their efforts in reaching out to the residents of Region 9, and noted that the developments in the region were contributing to the bridging of the developmental gap between the coastland and the hinterland. A report on the CARICOM Indian Summit held on the margins of the 74th session of the UN General Assembly was given by Foreign Affairs Minister Dr. Karen Cummins. India proposed a 14 million US dollar grant for community development projects and a $150 US million line of credit for the implementation of renewable energy projects regionally. Out of the two sums approved for CARICOM by the Indian government, Guyana would receive $1 million US in the form of a grant for quick impact community development projects and $10 million from the line of credit for the implementation of development of renewable energy resources including solar and climate change related projects. Cabinet also approved attendance at several overseas workshops for local heads of agencies and gave its no objection to several multi-million dollar contracts. DG Harmon indicated that the conversation has already started on the removal of several critical public infrastructure agencies from the coast due to adverse climate effect changes. You cannot get away from the fact of climate change. You cannot escape the fact that they will be rising sea levels. Every time there's a high tide on the, in Region 3, where I'm, where I'm from, you can see the, the, the seawall is here, and the water is, is meters above the seawall. So unless you keep building over the wall higher and higher and higher and higher, there must at some point in time be in our consideration what we're going to do going forward. The challenges faced by thousands of Republic Bank customers was also noted. We will not sit idly by and see large sections of our population being affected by an entity and sit down and do nothing about it. I think that Minister Jordan, uh, when he gets back here, would probably outline some other measures which will have to be put in place. If the bank has to alter its its mechanisms, it has to put in place some manual facility so that the people can get their money, then they will have to do it. They will have to do it. Paul McAdam with Cabinet Roundup. The municipality of Madia in the Putaro Seperuni region celebrated one year as a capital town under the theme Celebrating Our Gains, Showcasing Our Culture, Securing Our Future. Amidst challenges, Madia's one-year anniversary as a municipality comes at a time when it is on the fast track to development. Minister of Public Health, the Honorable Valda Lawrence, delivered the keynote address at a simple ceremony to kick off activities in observance of this milestone. As we celebrate, comrades, the APNU and AFC coalition spearheaded your development in its mere tenure of four years. And we must mention that and we must never forget that. It didn't take us 10 years or 15 years or 20 years. When we came to office, we knew that we had to ensure that Madia, among the other hinterland communities, receive positive development. Madia's mayor, His Worship David Adams, said the tongue like its people is determined to thrive despite the challenges, hence the benefiting nature of the celebration's theme. He outlined successes thus far. Despite all these challenges, your council has endeavored to administer the affairs of this tongue 
in a fair and transparent manner. Solar street lights are being installed at predetermined locations around Maja, and plans are afoot to install similar lights at Chumatumari Junction. A smart shop, a smart stop, complete with Wi-Fi and internet services will be built in the vicinity of the hospital in the coming weeks. Madhya is becoming the place where most coastlanders and even foreigners are looking to ply their trade as the main economic activity in and around the town is mining. For Info Hub, Delicia Haynes. Over the next three years, the government estimates that $14 billion will be needed to execute emergency works along Guyana's foreshore in an effort to strengthen the sea defenses that are threatened by climatic conditions. Minister of Public Infrastructure, the Honorable David Patterson, made this announcement on Wednesday evening at the University of Guyana's Turkentain Talks. When we do start thinking of building, we have to start thinking of the locations. We have to start the very difficult and painful thought of the future of our city. The cost for the next two years is estimated for these 32.9 kilometers, the cost to repair, rehabilitate, to replant um, for these 32.9 kilometers is 14 billion Guyana dollars. This 32.9 kilometer zone is within the 473.7 kilometer area of Guyana's shoreline from Shell Beach in Region 1 to the Quarantine in Region 6. The theme of the discussion was green building for resilient future cities. In this regard, Minister Patterson urged the panelists to pay attention to the location in which buildings are constructed so that they can withstand not only the test of time but climatic conditions. For 2019, the Danzig to Fairfield area in Region 5 has received the brunt of the spring tides that reached record heights. Under the Public Infrastructure Ministry, $2 billion has been allocated annually to address the country's sea defences. Government intends to establish a high-level committee to address some of the issues and recommendations that would have been brought to the fore from the discussions. Shaquille Bourne, for InfoHub. The village of Shia in the Deep South, Region 9, received the sum of $1.5 million to boost the village's agriculture drive. Shia is a Wapichan village located in the Deep South, Rubanoni, with a population of over 400 persons who practice subsistence farming. A part of its 2019 presidential grant, the village opted to expand its agriculture drive to more large-scale farming of cash crops at a cost of $1.5 million. Over the weekend, Minister of Indigenous Peoples Affairs Sidney Alicock traveled to the village and delivered the check and encouraged the village council to ensure each household benefits, citing the example of family-owned farms. I want you to really use it for, you could have family, family farms and benefit from it because your children would eat, you would eat, and you could sell. She is known for the famous Shear Rock, which is a tourist attraction. Minister Alicock called on the villagers to develop their tourism package and explore other projects that will improve the village economy through the creation of jobs. This big rock here is a, it's a, big, it's a big draw for Shear. And you have to get the people who know about tourism. You already are here. You know the area. All you have to do is focus. You could have people landing in Aishalton, coming down here, you, you have to pick them up there, you have to get your uh, transport, and you have to learn how to greet, meet and greet people, uh, how you present your foods, and I'm quite certain you're already doing that, because I know that persons come here to ride up the rocks and stuff like that. But you have to take control, it must be you who managing this business. Nobody else. You, this is your home, this is your rock. The presidential grant program is one of the significant interventions undertaken by the government to boost economic and social development for indigenous peoples in their respective communities. Villages and communities receive between 500000 to $2 million based on the population size. Seneca Thorne, InfoHub. History has been created in three hinterland villages in the north and central Rupununi as residents have first-time access to clean running water in their homes. 
Residents of Kaikumbe, Mokomoko, and Yupakari are the most recent recipients of clean, potable water. Along with the drilling of a well and the installation of a photovoltaic system, transmission, and distribution pipelines, individual service connections have been set up in Kaikumbe. The community now has 90% access and GWI will be working towards 100% in 2020. Minister of Social Protection, the Honorable Amna Ali, also highlighted the government's efforts to bridge the gap between the quality of life in the hinterland and the coastland. Our president, my president, your president, wants the best for you. And that is why one of his policies is to bridge the gap between the hinterland regions and the coastland region. Because whatever opportunities are offered on the coastland, it must be offered to those in the hinterland. And I think that that is a good thing because what we enjoy in Georgetown, you must be in Mokomoko and be able to enjoy it. Over in Yupakari, Director General of the Ministry of the Presidency, Joseph Harmon, commissioned a new well, where all residents there will benefit from potable water in their homes. Speaking at the event, Mr. Harmon reiterated that water quality is one of GWI's top priorities and as such the water residents are receiving is of WHO standard. Recipients of yet another well, the Mokomoko community previously had a windmill driven water supply system which includes a shallow hand dug well and the water supply proved to be a challenge during the dry season. Residents previously had to walk long distances to manually retrieve water from the well, which was prone to contamination. Fulfilling the Sustainable Development Goal 6, which seeks to ensure access to water and sanitation for all, GWI has been improving water quality and bringing first-time portable water to communities around the country in an aggressive campaign to enhance the quality of life for all Guyanese. Natisha Isaacs for InfoHub. Farmers in Burbies and across the country will now be able to benefit from a state-of-the-art soil and plant testing laboratory, which was commissioned at the St. John's campus, East Burbies. Sudamu so Jagmohan, a farmer of Blackbush Polder who has been in the business for over 40 years, said it is a timely and welcoming initiative for farmers in Burbies. He noted that next year he will be taking soil to be tested before he begins planting a new crop. The facility was built at the cost of $40 million by the Nan Prasad Group of Companies in collaboration with the University of Guyana and has the capacity to test soil, water and plant disease. We understand that for us to survive and to be in business, we need to have partnerships and partnerships in the sense that we need to have everybody being profitable, making money, and in that way, it becomes sustainable. It continues to, to, to go on for life, right? And the effort of this lab is to do just that, right? What we feel is that the potential is there for the rice industry to increase yield by 25 to 30%. The company has also agreed to give the university a percentage of its profit after expenses and provide two support scholarships to students at the Burbies campus. This agreement is valuable in regard to three areas. One, we are happy to host it on our campus. Two, our students are going to intern here and work here. Three, the community of the surrounding the university, not only here in Burbies, but other parts of the country, will see a value um, to this, from this project in that they will be able to do some good testing, help them to solve some of the major problems that have been plaguing them towards, uh, and to help them to move towards higher productivity. The facility is now fully functional and farmers no longer have to rely on personal judgment, but rather they will be better equipped with scientific data to make informed decisions to produce more crop. Leticia Isaacs for InfoHub. Minister of Education, the Honorable Dr. Nicolette Henry, commissioned two additional mobile psychosocial units at the cost of $21 million. 
At a simple commissioning ceremony at the Education Ministry's Brick Dam office, Minister Henry explained that the unit will not only provide services in Region 4, but in far-flung areas where it is most needed. She added that it is expected that the services will go beyond just providing counseling to students, but be available to teachers and parents. I would hope to see that we go beyond students and perhaps not in the so distant future. We should be in a position to offer support um, if parents really need support and teachers because a lot of times we have, you know, parents and teachers that require some amount of psychosocial counseling and welfare support and we're not in a good place to offer that. And so we recognize that as a deficiency in the ministry and it's something that we are working on. Regional Education Officer Marcia Paddy Andrews said that the mobile psychosocial unit is intended to identify and assist children with school-related problems and help to foster a greater relationship between the parent and the school which the child attends. It is our hope that with two additional units being brought into operation, sufficient sensitization will be done to ensure that persons can access this service. Additionally, the communities will become au fait with the roles of the unit in the psychosocial economic development of the child. The two units were commissioned at a cost of $21 million. The ministry is now equipped with three such units, as one was commissioned in November 2018. The focus of the unit is to increase the learner's ability to exercise control, reduce stress levels, enhance learners' resilience, enhance the use of effective coping skills, serve as a quick response to trauma, and maximize the support of family and friends. Seneca Thorne, InfoHub. With over 152 million reported cases of child labor worldwide, Minister of Social Protection, the Honorable Amna Ali, said no country can achieve or sustain prosperity on the backs of children. Ghana is passionately working towards the elimination of child labor by 2025, an objective of the National Child Labor Policy. On Wednesday, social workers commenced a three-day training on child labor inspection at the Public Service Ministry. Social Protection Minister the Honorable Anna Ali said the exploitation of children should not be tolerated under any circumstance. When children are exploited for the economic gains of others, everybody loses. Children lose, their family lose, the nation loses. When even one child is exploited, every one of us is diminished. Global estimates show that 218 million children between the ages of 5 and 17 are employed. Among them, 152 million are victims of child labor and almost half, 73 million, work under hazardous conditions. Wiesel Melville is a child labor coordinator attached to the International Labor Organization. She told participants that it is time the troubling issue is addressed. We are starting 2020, which is the new decade next year. And the SDGs, that is the Global Sustainable Development Goals, which everybody else is working towards for 2030. But for some reason, the objective of eliminating child labor has an advanced deadline of 2025 is a point to note because it says that the global community, world leaders and workers have decided that ensuring that children can en enjoy their childhood, ensuring that children are exposed to all of the positive opportunities for self-actualization and realization of their potential is something of utmost priority. She reported that Guyana has over the last six years been leading in its commitment to address child labor. In 2014, Guyana was one of the original signatory countries to the ILO's regional initiative, Latin America and Caribbean free of child labor. Reporting for InfoHub, Alexis Rodney. Changing the lives of Guyanese in the 21st century with the use of digital solutions is the goal as the Ministry of Public Telecommunications hosted a third hackathon. Hackathon 2019 will see four teams in a grueling software development battle to create software to report crime with an emphasis on domestic violence. 
a collaborative effort between the Ministry, the ICT Access and E-Services Project, and the United Nations Development Program, the outcome of the three-day event will be implemented to create real solutions in Guyana. So we really have the responsibility, we feel, to provide the platform that will deliver a high level of service. And this is even more necessary for as we move Ghana towards creating a digital state. The ministry continues to focus on the development of an ICT-ready workforce through initiatives which can create solutions to national issues and by extension create employment opportunities. Today's hackathon is intended to provide digital solutions to areas of sustainable livelihood, e-learning and security. We look forward to working with the winners of this innovation challenge and we wish you luck who would be granted the opportunity to scale up their prototype and to provide not only effective solutions to address national priorities, but also to demonstrate to stakeholders and public institutions the potential impact of using ICTs to deliver public services. As the government continues to enhance Guyana's technological capacity and infrastructure, the ministry will continue to do its part to foster the use of ICT as a tool for national development, creativity, and innovation. Themed Hack for a Digital Solution, this year's hackathon runs from November 29 to December 1, 2019 at the Arthur Chung Conference Center. Natisha Isaacs for InfoHub. All terrain vehicles and motorcycles handed over to the Region 9 Health Department to boost efforts in zeroing maternal and neonatal deaths in the region. Maternal and neonatal deaths in the hinterland have been on the decline within the last few years. The Ministry of Public Health continues to deliver with efforts to further reduce the statistics. ATVs and motorcycles were handed over to the Region 9 Health Department to aid in this effort. Minister of Public Health, the Honorable Valdo Lawrence, explained how this will benefit villages in Region 9. Many of you on the coastland who will be watching this will say, oh, it's just a few bicycles and two ATVs. But I can assure you to the people in the savannas and in the to the people in the north, um, Rupununi, and even central Rupununi, this is like good goal, solid goal to them because accessibility is not as easy as we do it on the coastland. 90% of the region's community health workers and primary health care staff are women who will utilize the transportation to effectively carry out their duties in saving lives. Home visits to provide pre- and postnatal care will be boosted with the availability of the ATVs and motorcycles. Let them, uh, and its, it's uh, surrounding, they are very big areas. Uh, the health center, for example, might be in the center, but um, these health workers will have to travel miles, kilometers, before they reach uh, uh, individual homes. Uh, so this they used to do one, home visits, even during um, the pregnancy period and after delivery as well to take care of the mother and the baby as well. Um, it allows them to not only uh, do um, interpersonal visits, but to take resources, do vaccinations out in the communities. That was Dr. Niall Utman, Regional Health Officer. The donation was made possible through an Inter-American Development Bank loan to the Public Health Ministry to address needs in regions 3, 4, and 9 towards zeroing the maternal debts. This has been InfoHub Recap, which looks at major stories scattered during the week of November 23 to 29. Remember to subscribe to our website for more stories and follow us on our social media platforms. Also, do take some time to review the Diaspora Digest and other publications found on our website. Have a safe and enjoyable weekend. Goodbye.